Between our obsession with mobile electronics and the growing popularity of electric vehicles, lithium-ion battery demand is growing at an astonishing rate. Most of that demand is being driven by automotive sales, which consume 60% of lithium-ion batteries, even though they only account for about 1% of automotive sales. It's not hard to imagine how far that's going to go in time, which raises the big question, what happens to all those batteries when they die? I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. I don't know about you, but I use rechargeable lithium-ion batteries for pretty much everything around my house. But when they no longer hold a charge, it's not always clear how to dispose of them. The same is true for old mobile phones, laptops, or tablets. You can sometimes find recycling containers at some big box stores, but it's not always apparent if they'll actually take the device that you're trying to get rid of, so it's not exactly an easy or frictionless user experience to recycle old lithium-ion batteries. And this is just consumer electronics I'm talking about. When you add the scale of electric vehicles, home batteries like Tesla's Powerwall, or grid-scale energy storage systems, the scope of the problem gets dramatically bigger. In 2015, lithium-ion battery demand was about 60 gigawatt hours, but just five years later had ballooned to 300 gigawatt hours. And according to some projections, it's expected to hit over two terawatt hours by 2030, which includes everything from consumer electronics to transportation. If you're talking about just transportation, the same report suggests that it will make up about 1.8 terawatt hours of that demand. Which raises another question, do we have enough materials to support that amount of battery production? The most common materials needed for lithium-ion batteries are nickel, cobalt, lithium, graphite, and copper. Just the demand for lithium alone is expected to grow from about 300,000 metric tons in 2020 to over 1.7 million metric tons in 2030. And while there are technically enough resources to support the demand, there aren't enough mines to dig it up and process it, and just adding mines alone isn't the answer. Which brings us to recycling. Now, there's a common refrain that I hear from electric vehicle skeptics all the time. There's no way to recycle the batteries, which is just not true. In fact, there's a mad dash of companies all racing to corner the market for lithium-ion battery recycling. There are around 100 companies worldwide and dozens in the US and Europe alone that are all coming at the problem with unique techniques and technologies. Companies like Umicore, Neometals Limited, Glencore, Lifecycle, and Redwood Materials. A common approach to recycling batteries is to have a spoke and hub model. This is when a company has multiple locations that are set up for processing spent lithium ion cells. They'll make sure that they're safely discharged and that they're ground up and processed into a black mass, which means they've removed things like plastics, copper, and aluminum. The remaining mixture is made up of things like lithium, manganese, and cobalt. It looks just like it sounds. It's a black mass of battery parts. That's transferred to a centralized hub facility that then processes the black mass to convert it back into its component parts. There's a lot of nuance to how this is done, but there are two overarching methods. Hydrometallurgy, which uses chemicals, or pyrometallurgy, which uses high heat. I had a chance to talk to Zarko Maselgia, who's the CTO of American Manganese, which has a novel approach to lithium-ion battery recycling. In this case of American Manganese's recyclical process, it's hydrometallurgy. We use just hydrometallurgy, so there's no high heat in the process. But then again, you have a hydrometallurgical process, but there is different techniques in the hydrometallurgy, like what chemical reagents you use. In it. So hydrometallurgy is a general term, but how it's done um, is, you know, that's within our patents as well. So when you're talking about chemicals, concerns come up around worker safety and how environmentally safe it is. In this case, it's very safe and the process itself is kind of recyclable. So with, with our process, we've developed a closed circuit or locked cycle process where the solution from the end of the process is cycled back within the process. So you, you don't have any harmful environmental discharge. It's, it's within the contained working area as well. You are dealing with these chemical reagents. So there is a level of like know-how and how to handle those materials. So what does this process actually look like? Well, Zarka was kind enough to walk me through their test facility, which looked a lot like I imagined. Kind of a big, big chemistry set. It all starts with the scrap or black mass. Now, on this issue of scrap, that's American manganese initial focus. As an example, when a typical cylindrical style cell is manufactured, they're coating cathode and anode layers under foil sheets and then rolling them up. I mean, it's oversimplified, but in a nutshell, that's what's happening. There are parts of that that are trimmed off during the manufacturing process. Cells that don't pass quality assurance testing, a whole host of reasons that manufacturing defects occur, which creates a lot of wasted material. A good example is to look at how much cell production that Tesla and Panasonic were having to scrap during the initial stages of the Model 3 production ramp-up. An average of 39% quarterly cell loss. 
they were essentially having to throw away three to four cells for every 10 that they made. Recovering that scrap and processing it so that they can go back into the manufacturing cycle can save a lot of money and resources. Zarco showed me some of the cathode scrap they sourced from third parties. You see some of them big chunks. You can cut this down. I guess you'd call it shredding as well, but not shredding a whole battery. Because then, then you, know, you have a very pure product. There's no more. It's essentially your base metals. You have your lithium and aluminum and then PVDF. So maybe you have you know, some small percentage of like plastics. What you see, like in this tank, for instance, those foils would go in and we would you know, cut them up into kind of those little tinier pieces to just allow for better mixing. Then the reagents we use would separate that active material from the aluminum foil. And essentially what you would produce from that then, you're pretty much pulling those metals into solution. And here you would have the, what would be the pregnant leach solution. So essentially in these, if I can remember correctly, I think this would be the NMC, but in this solution, you know, this is your nickel, manganese, cobalt, lithium, and you may have some other impurities as well. After that, the materials are co-precipitated out, which is a process for separating a solid from a solution. When everything is complete, you'll have clean aluminum and foil scrap. From the trimmings, we separate the active material to the aluminum foil. Then we leach, we leach that active material into solution. And then what we pull out first, in this case, let's say this is an NCA, in here would be you know, lithium, nickel, cobalt, maybe some impurities, filter out the impurities and then precipitate out nickel and cobalt together, the hydroxide. And then what's left in that solution is lithium, which we also recover and we can recover as a carbonate or a hydroxide. Yeah. And then when you see the bags of material that we've produced, you know, this is a nickel cobalt carbonate and this is a hydroxide. Really the difference is what reagents we're using in that precipitation. So there was a few trials of, uh, of different materials. What sets apart American Manganese's approach to recycling is how they're trying to vertically integrate the process into existing battery manufacturing facilities. Instead of the spoke and hub model, they're working closely with battery manufacturers to custom tailor the recycling process to end up with a usable cathode mix for producing new cells based on that manufacturer's needs. Each company has very specific chemistry mixes for their cathodes. Different amounts of nickel, cobalt, lithium, different particle sizes, shapes, and densities that are needed. So the final cathode precursor that they can deliver cuts out a refinement step that's typically needed from other recycling approaches that you might see with spoke and hub. You have uh, the different compositions of like nickel, manganese, and cobalt. And the approach of working more so directly with a cathode manufacturer or battery manufacturer is that one, your feedstock is homogenous. And then there, you know, the material can be directly integrated more so than sold to an independent recycler, which then sells that into kind of midstream within the lithium ion battery market, only to be you know, further refined and processed. That tight integration with dealing with scrap loss can have a big impact on driving down costs, especially when you consider how much of the materials they can recover. From lab tests and uh, our pilot plant tests, um, I mean, within our patent, we've achieved up to 100% of lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, aluminum. Um, I mean, we've scaled up to a pilot plant test and, you know, some of our extraction results in the uh, pre-leach and leach was 99.7%. Um, and then that's with, with high purity as well. There's also the transportation of materials and finished batteries to consider too. Currently, the majority of lithium ion manufacturing is in China and the United States, but China dominates with over 80% of global production. The United States is about 8%, which is primarily from Tesla. But the materials like lithium come mostly from Australia and Chile. And recycling batteries closer to the locations where they'll actually be manufactured will save significantly there as well. You're crossing multiple continents by the time it actually gets into a lithium ion battery. You reduce on transportation costs. And then the material as well is very pure. I mean, when you're mining things, for some deposits, you know, 30% that grade is, is an amazing thing, but you know, what do you do with the 17% of waste? So there's, there's those things aren't considered. Reducing transportation and higher grade materials that are ready for new manufacturing sounds like a step in the right direction. So what's the holdup? Why isn't this standard operating procedure yet? Well, these things take time. Whenever I've talked to anyone in the field like this, a common theme always comes up. It takes a lot of time to go from bench research to test facility, to demonstrator plant, to full-scale production. 
Many of the recycling companies out there are somewhere around the pilot plant and demonstrator plant phase of this rollout. And now with this demonstration, it's going to be a, an, a, an upgrade or a scale up of that pilot plant to uh, a 500 kilogram per day capacity. But now each of those stages will just all be integrated in one and ran continuously over you know, a few weeks. And from there, we'll be able to pull engineering data, economic data to put forward into a design for commercialization. So each step of the way is you know, de-risking the process. Lifecycle, which is another leader in the space, has been building out a spoken hub network. They already operate a demonstrator plant in Kingston, Canada, and it's building out another facility in Rochester, New York, my old stomping grounds, in an old Eastman Kodak building. That's supposed to be open in 2022, and they just recently announced another facility in Arizona. And I can't not mention former Tesla co-founder J.B. Straubel's Redwood Materials. They've been making a bit of a splash recently for obvious reasons. J.B. Straubel is intimately aware of the intricacies and challenges ahead of us with lithium-ion batteries. Their initial facility is able to recover about 80% of a battery's lithium and up to 95% of other materials. And they're already profitable at the unit level. According to one report, the battery recycling market is expected to grow from $1.5 billion in 2019 to $12.2 billion in 2025 and $18.1 billion in 2030. That's definitely good growth potential, but not the scale that we need to match the battery demand growth rate. We're just at the tip of the iceberg here. And while recycling will be essential for sustainability and meeting demand, it's most likely not going to replace mining completely. I don't think recycling will completely replace mining anytime soon. I think it'll, it'll complement the supply chain, but I think we're going to need both for the, the uh, near future at least. So what do you think? Will recycling overtake the need for mining? Jump into the comments and let me know. If you like this video, be sure to check out one of the ones I've linked to right here, and be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell if you think I've earned it. And as always, I'd like to thank all of my patrons and welcome some new members, which I'm going to butcher your names, but new Supporter Plus members Wayne Palmetter and Thomas First, and a new producer, Mohsen Kalkali. Thanks to all of you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.